from the University of Western Australia, Searches for Axions at the University of Western Australia. Michael? Uh, can, can you see my um, screen? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Giannis. Um, I, yeah, I'm gonna talk about our work at UWA on searching for axions. Um, we are the Quantum Technologies and Dark Matter Research Lab, and we're funded by two ARC centers of excellence here in Australia. One is Engineered Quantum Systems, which allows us access to quantum technologies, and the other is the newly fo uh, formed ARC Center of Excellence of Dark Matter Particle Physics, which is um, uh, appropriately titled for a search of axions. Okay, so here's a, a sort of, um, picture of our team. Um, we, we do have positions available for postdocs um, with the funding we have. We have three academic staff. We have a, a, some really good postdocs. We hire a technician. The workshop, uh, our uh, mechanical workshop is right next to the lab. So that, that's very useful. Every time we want an experiment, we come up with a new idea. A student can just go down there, we can design it. And we have a bunch of students um, who are doing a lot of the work. Uh, so you can go to our website and do a, a virtual tour if you like, if you're interested. I just thought I would mention that. Um, and if you look into our labs, you'll see the most important instrument is the coffee machine. So every morning um, I, I make sure I supply coffee to everyone in, in the um, group. So first I'll just generally talk about the Wave Like Dark Matter program at UWA. We have become part of ADMX and some of our students are working with that, which I find really useful because the wealth of exper experience with ADMX of data analysis and, and, and scanning for axions is, is very beneficial for us for our own work. Our, our main experiment is the oscillating resonator group axion experiment. And I'll tell you about that. It's running at the moment and it'll be, it's in its first phase and it's currently testing for axion cogenesis. Um, we have this other experiment using low noise oscillators. It, uh, when I first started here at UWA a long time ago, low noise oscillators was where it all started, building low uh, phase noise and amplitude oscillators. So we're always looking at ways of using those to test fundamental physics. And we have a way of doing that with axions, which I'll talk about. If I get time, I'll talk about low mass detect detectors with LCR circuits. Um, and uh, we have done searches with magnon cavities, a bit like quarks, but that's on the back burner. That'd be too much for us. And that's on the back burner until uh, the axion is detected. Then we can roll it out again because we'll know the frequency. Um, we've done a lot of um, QED with magnon cavity systems. We did one of the original papers. Um, which allowed us very strong coupling between, between spins and um, uh, uh, photons, but that was not um, uh, an experiment for axions. It was later when we saw the quarks experiments, we were inspired to get a student to work on that, but it's um, uh, just in the, in the back burner at the moment. We've also done, we, we're, because of our low noise oscillators, we've done clock comparison experiments, but that's a different type of dark matter. So I wouldn't be talking about that. So here's some recent papers um, that were published in this area. Um, so now um, Axion Haloscope Dark Matter Experiments at UWA. We have three dilution fridges. Um, this is our, if you go on to our um, uh, lab tour, this is the Axion Dark Matter Lab. And this is organ um, undressed in this, at that time when we took that photo. Um, we have quite a few, we have three dilution fridges. This is one of our smaller ones. Um, and then we have a 14, seven Tesla and three Tesla magnets, which we've got plans for for various experiments. Um, here's, a, here's what the magnets look like. And we have a lot of, um, over the years, we've built up a lot of um, different equipment from RF to 100 gigahertz. Um, here's some examples of some network analyzers, network analyzers and some experiments going on in the lab with a couple of students, Graham and Will. This presentation, I will concentrate first on organ and the status and future plans. 
And then I'll talk about the upload experiment, which uses low noise oscillators. And if, if I have time, I will talk a bit about low mass searches and the way to use pointing theorem to calculate sensitivity. So uh, organ cu current st status and future plans. I especially want to acknowledge Paul Alton from ANU, who was an expert with FPGAs and data analysis. And he's written the software for us, which is vital for us uh, to take data on this experiment. Um, the organ oscillating res resonator group axion experiment, it's over here, up around the Mad Max regime. Um, the reason we went here is because we were experienced in those frequencies and it was relatively bare. Um, and so we decided to um, target this area first up um, here. Uh, we did our first um, sort of prototype run um, a, a few years back in 2017. And ever since then, we've been sort of gearing up to try and do a, a, a scanning experiment. Um, yeah, so this high frequency regime, as you heard from Mad Max, it's a, it's a sort of hard area to explore. Um, but there's this model that predicts that the axion should be in that range. And that's what sort of motivated us to go there. Um, as an experimentalist, there's all these theories, and I don't know one from the other of these different axion theories, but if any if theorists can tell me it's a good place to look, I think it's that's what we should do. So our, our critical research areas to, prove the scan, to improve the scan rate and model sensitivity is um, we need tunable sensitive resonators, we, we need low noise amplification, and and good data acquisition and analysis. We all know this, we've talked about it this week. Um, the heliscope scan rate, this is the formula that you might see, and there's three aspects. There's a magnet and dilution bridge, which we can try and improve these parameters. And indeed, um, in, in, the, in the talk on Mad Max, this is the dipole magnet. If they can build that, that would be very useful. Um, we need a novel resonator design up at these frequencies and we will need some dielectric with novel tuning. Um, and uh, that would be to improve Q and the form factor. And we need the good amplifiers, which would be a single photon counter, um, would be ideal to improve this up at those frequencies. So the dilution fridge and magnet are here. Uh, they arrived in 2019, and since then we've been getting the experiment ready. We have this big blue force system. Um, we decided to get a really big system because in the end we want to put big magnets on there. And the moment our, we hope we, it was meant to be a 14 Tesla magnet, but it's only ever got to 12.5. Um, now to the cavity characterization. Um, so our first attempt is just using the normal proven way in all the other experiments that are, uh, are used in cult task and ADMX. And that's with a rod uh, moving around in a small cavity. And we're doing it at four Kelvin because up at the frequencies where we're, where we're at for our first experimental run, this is, uh, was our, the easiest thing to do. Um, here is the cavity we built and the tuning um, uh, curve of the TM010 mode. And as it tunes, you, you uh, can model it and you can get a similar sort of tuning curve. If we go up to 200, you can just see it turning over here and up at 200, it should be turning over here. So we sort of know the modes very well and you have to know the modes very well to calculate the form factors and to know what these mode crossings are. There's some difficult with tuning when cold. If you look at here, there's some scrape marks from the first runs because the tolerances are hard. Um, but when we ramped the magnet up, we found that it actually improved the way, improved its tuning. The magnetic field did something to allow it to tune in a nicer way and not get stuck. That was just a bit of luck. Um, so to improve the cavity, we need to, this is something we need to do. Um, we've got this idea of dielectric boosted axion sensitivity. Um, so we can take a higher order TM mode and make it axion sensitive by placing dielectric in the outer phase regions. So the, what would usually be canceled is not canceled in the sensitivity. And that's because the field in the dielectric regions is uh, reduced. And we have two papers on different ways of doing that. And we're still working on them. And the, the idea goes like this. 
if you have a resonance um, with plus and minus and you've got an E dot B, this E dot B term will cancel this E dot B term if I have a constant magnetic field. So if we place a dielectric here, the electric field is reduced and that is good um, because now we can um, um, uh, imbalance the, uh, the, so we get a positive sensitivity. So here's in a ca cavity, a TM410 mode. If we put these dielectric uh, wedges in here and rotate them, we, we can get a, um, a variety of modes which will be sensitive and tuned. Um, so we've done some finite element modeling and we, we, uh, we're, we're basically putting two wedges to remain stationary while the other two are allowed to move relative to the stationary ones. And so you can see something like this, which where these wedges can be twisted with respect to each other. And that will give you a tuning, a frequency tuning of various modes in the structure and a certain form factor where we've, where we've written here C, V, G, C squared, V squared, G. Um, so that's where we are at the resonator. We are basically doing R&D to make this resonator while the first phase of the experiment is going. The other sort of critical part is the amplifiers. And uh, what we really want is a single photon counter. And um, so we're working with some theorists in Equus to try and understand them. And um, then um, we have got some, um, some devices from Leonard Kuzman um, but we hope to get some more devices. Um, that's not our expertise in making devices. We have to rely on other. So single photon detection is superior to uh, an SQL linear ampl amplifier under the right conditions. Um, for our experiment, if it's 100 milli millikelvin and greater than 15 gigahertz, um, then this, the standard quantum limit noise is on the order of 1K and the ratio of the standard quantum limit linear amplifier to a single photon detector noise power is given by this. And um, so this could be about 50 times noisier. Um, so really it would be great if someone could develop a single photon counter. And if we lower this temperature, because really our dilution fridges can get to 20 millikelvin with the load, um, this becomes higher. So that's, I guess that's partly why we're having this um, workshop. Um, so uh, we're looking at this sort of um, structure from Leonid Kuzman um, uh, and where the photon will kick this into a voltage state and then we can measure that. Um, that's the basic idea. We've already heard talks on that. Um, so we have some devices and, and this is a picture I took today of Ben and Graham who have just loaded it into the dilution fridge for some measurements. So the, 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 the run plan, um, phase one is a narrow search around 15 to 16 gigahertz and 26 to 27 gigahertz. Um, so this is the phase one uh, that we hope to do. And we're currently in to this stage, we're just using a hemp amplifier with a, with a small TM01 tuning rod resonator with a form factor of 0.4. Um, we're testing this ALP cogenesis as uh, predicted from the early universe. That's something we can do with this sensitivity. Um, and phase two will be a wider search building on the expertise from phase one, hopefully with the new resonator. Um, and if we, if we could get quantum limited amplifiers with two to four cavities, um, light red green, is the single photon counter. Um, if we could get, we could get reduced down with a single photon counter. So let's spell that out. Um, at the moment we're using the hemp and we're up here. And if we can use SQL amplifiers, we can get down here. More if we need the single photon counter to get to the, to the um, work model bands. Um, but this is underway and this is our experiment. Um, you can see the cavity here, which is loaded into the dilution fridge. Um, and uh, we're testing about this sensitivity. The tuning rod um, should go, allow us to go with this one gigahertz, 15 to 16 gigahertz with just a hemp amplifier. It fits inside our bore, um, but the scan rate isn't the only thing making the high frequency search dif difficult. It's the fact that the volume is small. Uh, 
and the frequency goes uh, inverse of R and the, and the volume is R cubed, as we all know. So, and the machining tolerance has become more important, um, which is, um, we've got a good workshop, thankfully, so that helps us. So here's a setup. Um, we have this digitizer for the data analysis and an IQ mixer um, setup. So basically we have the rod tuning, we have a VNA attached so we can measure the Q and the frequency um, in between um, tuning. And uh, we have a synthesizer which helps us demodulate so we can do an FFT with a 48 megahertz offset. Um, so we step motor, sweep for Q and frequency, set to demodulation frequency and digitize. That's basically what we do. Uh, we're scanned so far for 2.5 weeks, so far 600 megahertz. Um, and now we, we need to um, uh, adjust the cavity to get the other part of the frequency. So data taking, we're using a digitizer program by our friend Paul at ANU, who's part of Equus. Um, we have, uh, uh, we, we, we do this um, 26,000 point FFT window and we see the cavity thermal noise in a, in a 12.5 megahertz span. We crop it to six megahertz. This is what it looks like coming out. Um, it's on a background here, but that's the thermal noise of the cavity. Um, this, this good thing about up at these frequencies, there seems to be less contamination that you might see in the frequencies around ADMX or something like that. Um, they're higher frequencies. Um, we can overlap single bins in quadrature, and this is our tuning. Um, you can see as we went up in frequency, this, our signal to noise got better. Um, uh, it's probably due to with some loss or VSWR dependence. Uh, the axion line width is about 32 bins. Uh, we, can, we can combine the bins horizontally like this. And uh, when we take a sort of a histogram, it is Gaussian noise. So that's good. We're combined in quadrature, Gaussian as one might expect, no spurious RF noise sources detected so far. And we're on track for the most sensitive limits in this region. We've already got preliminary uh, measurements in this region, and this is still to come over here. Um, the green data is already taken and it's based on preliminary analysis and the red, red cavity will be in the fridge uh, right now. Uh, so this is actually the raw preliminary analysis, but it's very preliminary. We've got to confirm it and look at correlation coefficients and things like that. Um, so uh, the next phase is hopefully we'll, we'll finish this phase um, in the next month or so, and then probably this won't commence till next year, but who knows. Um, and we're prototyping typing our current re res resonator. Our biggest problem is probably a lack of person power at the moment. Um, this is our, uh, our resonator. And um, uh, in phase two, we'll be broken into five gigahertz chunks. And hopefully there's someone's developed a single photon counter by then. And hopefully we'll use multi multiple cavity arrays where the organ um, acronym comes from. A summary. Uh, of organ is that um, we've commenced. Uh, we've got two phases as, as I've shown. One is the initial phase, which is very useful so we can get everything working and we can know how to look for axions and the quantum sensors. Um, the next stage of this talk is to talk about this experiment that we're doing um, called upload. Um, so this is a um, uh, up conversion low noise oscillator axion detection experiment. And uh, Kat Thompson is doing the, is a student on this and doing her PhD partly on this and other things. Um, and it's done a very good job. And uh, this is a new te technique uh, we call the AC Haloscope. And there's two electric modes instead of one mode and a DC field in, in, um, uh, across a cavity. So in this, the fact that we have no applied DC magnetic field can be useful. Um, you don't have to worry about that, but there's a whole bunch of other things you have to worry about. You just trade one problem with the other. But lucky we're experts in this area through our low noise oscillator program. Um, so you need one AC mode, which is supplies a background field. So in the axion um, uh, two photon transition, 
you have one background field and instead of being a DC field, this is now an AC field and that interacts and it gives you the, a readout photon, uh, which you will detect. And so there's two ways you can do this. One is axion down conversion, where the axion is the sum of the two frequencies and one is up conversion. We are focusing on up conversion because down conversion, um, I don't think is competitive where up, up, uh, up conversion can take you places where are uh, hard to get. Um, so we call this up load, up conversion, low noise oscillator. It used to be loop oscillator, it's now low noise oscillator axion detection. And um, the axion, uh, you can look at where the axion is and um, the axion should be at the difference frequency plus or minus the Fourier frequency of the spectrum you're looking at. Uh, so you can do a phase or power measurement and look in a spectrum, which is slightly offset by these two. And you can do the calculations to look at how to do that. Um, so we can excite a, a background mode and a readout mode um, to search for the, uh, this frequency shift um, technique use a frequency shift technique and um, you can ex uh, or you can excite a background mode and just look at the power at the readout mode and this is a power technique which has been proposed by others first by Pierre Sakidi in an archive paper back in 2010 and now there's a few others interested in this we were interested in this just basically because we had all the low phase noise oscillators but there's these two ways and we're we're going to look at to try and work out which one's the best way. So just a, a brief discussion on our low noise oscillators program. Um, we've built, we've probably built the lowest noise oscillators that you can get. Um, this technology that we developed a while ago, um, seeded a company here in Fremantle in Australia, which was selling low noise oscillators to around the world. But in the end, Raytheon bought it out and now owns the technology. Um, we can build very low phase noise and amplitude, amplitude noise oscillators. And the main reason is the expertise of my co longtime colleague, Eugene Ivanov, is very good and meticulous at building these low noise oscillators. And um, here's an example of a paper that was just uh, published where we're looking at the resonators suppressing the, the phase noise in the system. And these systems rely on this inter microwave interferometers. I'm not going to go into the details just to show you what we can do. Um, this paper's on the archive and it will show you that you can also make low, low AM noise. This is the AM noise spectrum of, of, of an oscillator at different places around the oscillator loop. And this is the PM noise. And in general, when if I'm trying to do a fundamental physics test, both AM and phase noise uh, low noise is required because in your, your, your cavity systems are highly dispersive and when they're highly dispersive you, can, you convert PM into AM and AM into PM so you can never make your measurements just uh, solely one quadrature there's always the other quadrature leaks in to some degree and this all has to be determined experimentally before you really know um, and even if you've got two modes which are orthogonal they're not entirely orthogonal you get leakage all these are very important parameters that um, theorists who come up with um, uh, projected sensitivities tend to look overlook. So here is the lab, which I just took this photo today to, to have a look at some of these oscillators that, are, that Eugene has put together now. Here is the cryogenic sapphire oscillator in a cryocooled system. This is the loop oscillator in the, in the feedback loop oscillator and this is the diagnostics and there's another one over here which I went around and take a look and you need to build two of them if you're going to measure them because you need to if you can't just build an oscillator and measure it you need to measure it against what you measure it with so you always have to build at least two when you're trying to determine how good an oscillator is so uh, we did a, a, a first publication which was published earlier this year but this was first pro proposed a while ago um, back in 2019. Um, I would say we, we, we found some errors in the calculations, um, thanks to Kevin, um, and wrote some um, uh, um, erratums. Um, but the, correct, the, the good news is the corrected version is consistent with all the other groups and what they've calculated. 
um, with the optical phase experiments, the AC microwave power techniques, and the total derivative equal in zero, but I'll talk a bit about that later as, again. Um, so looking into the future, um, we our phase two room temperature experiment is underway. I will show preliminary results here. Uh, we use frequency stabilized sources. Our first was just a loop oscillator at room temperature, and there's seven to five orders of magnitude improvement in phase noise. Under vacuum, so we got rid of frequency drift. Noise measurements and characterization is complete and conservative estimate is six orders of magnitude improvement from the original experiment. We always knew we could do this. It's just a real, it's a bit of an effort, um, but CAD has learned a lot, especially off Eugene on how to build these oscillators. Um, I'll, I'll discuss on detecting ultralight axions with frequency and power technique. And the cryogenic version is the way to go if we're going to move forward to try and get into model bands. There's some new calculations I've done, but I won't show them in this talk because they're, um, they're a bit detailed. Um, we've used perturbation analysis to confirm the frequency technique. Um, this is just uh, use, using perturbations to calculate a frequency shift, sort of like you do with permittivity in a cavity. Um, and we've also used, uh, in the power technique, we've used pointing theorem and we've got consistent results with others who, who have calculated the sensitivity of this experiment, but we've used pointing theorem. They've sort of used pointing theorem in an indirect way. They just have, haven't formally used it. Um, we use the compa comparison of the power and the frequency techniques to experimentally and theoretically uh, uh, compare the two. This has been undertaken now We've sort of completed some theory and we, we can do some experiments to um, compare them. And we want to determine the best technique to look at ultralight axial axions. And we're interested in using this technique to look between one megahertz and 300 megahertz mass range. Um, this pointing vector analysis in AC DC haloscopes, we've completed that. The DC one is on the archive. Um, and this was actually followed on some work that was done in uh, Korea that used the calculated um, the sensitivity with the pointing vector. Um, there's two poss possible choices. One's called is if you look into the history of the pointing vector, there was a controversy of which was the right one to use in matter, the Abraham or the Minkowski um, pointing vector. And it's been, it was a controversy that's, that's been around for a hundred years. And, um, the axion work is consistent with the Abraham pointing vector. Um, but the Minkowski one is the one that seems to win out when you talk about dielectrics and matter and should be taken seriously. And it predicts an enhanced sensitivity. Um, so, and the same with this pointing theorem, but I won't be showing that. That's just a calculation on paper at the moment. So how to choose a mode pair in this um, uh, situation? Um, you've got to calculate this overlap function between the two modes. You have your background mode and your readout mode and a unit vector of the electric field dotted with the, uh, the magnetic field um, background mode. So one of your modes, you, could, you can exchange them if you want. Um, so we use this mode pair and we can calculate these unit vectors and we can calculate this form factor. So we can do that for a whole lot of mode pairs. We can calculate this form factor and here's a bunch of mode pairs with with when they cross in frequency, because we want to use up conversion, they've got to be close in frequency. And with the, with the form factors, when they're close in frequency, this is M equals zero modes. This is M equal one modes as a Muslim one modes. This is M equal two. And we can see that quite a few mode pairs are sensitive. And if we look at the whole spectrum and we put those uh, modes on there, you can see there's a whole big density of modes there's probably the mode density is too high here. This leaves five modes, which we think uh, could be used. And this is their form factors. Um, uh, so, but there's another complication. If, you, if, M, if the azimuth mode number is not zero, I think experimentally, this is too complicated because you have a degenerate modes and you have to match the uh, symmetry in the azimuth. So if one is cos dependent, so does the output mode. And that's nearly impossible, I think. So to make the, to, to, to get rid of this complication, we should consider just M equals zero modes. So that just leaves us with two pairs to consider. 
for this type of experiment. I wipe out all those nodes. And so we're interested in this regime, um, about a, a megahertz to a couple of hundred megahertz. This is a very unexplored regime. And Pierre Sakivi thinks the axion might be here. So if he thinks it might be there, that's a good enough re reason for me to look. Um, so here's our first experiment it was on the tabletop. Um, it was just, a, it was very, it, it, was, it was open to the environment with no uh, noise cancelling. It was just a first original tabletop experiment just to see how it went. Uh, in the end, it was made a bit more neater. Um, and we, this was the experiment where we had the two modes. We used the TM mode as our readout mode and the TE mode as our background mode. And then we measured the phase noise in a certain way. I won't get into how the phase noise is measured, but we could get a phase noise spectrum. We actually represented this in terms of frequency noise. Frequency noise and phase noise is related. And SY is more natural when you've got a, a dispersive element because a phase shift turns into a frequency shift really. Um, so then you don't have to apply any transfer functions and you can, you can get a, a conversion factor with the, the axion will create a signal and there's a conversion factor. So that means they're related. That means you can look for axions. So therefore you can calculate um, the up conversion is get suppressed here, if, um, um, but you still get quite a, 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 a sensitivity. We've got the parameters of our two modes. And here we can look at the distribution of spikes and they fit as a gamma distribution. Um, so that was just statistics. The problem was we had drift. So, and the drift meant um, that as we were measuring our ax, uh, uh, the frequency of the axion we were scanning was changing and that smeared out the signal. We expect a signal like this. And because it was drifting with the signal that we were Will our sensitivity reduced by order of magnitude. That was solved in our second version of the experiment by putting it in vacuum. But the first, just on the table, everything's drifting around. And if the frequency drifts, then that's not good. You're, you're really lowering your sensitivity. Here, where, where you have an injected candidate, if we do 10 averages, it's hard to see it above all the noise or the, the, the random noise there. But with 130 averages, you can see it quite clearly. So our first experiment wasn't too sensitive. It was just very tabletop. You could do up conversion and down conversion. But our second experiment, which I'll show you, uh, we're now down here past the cast region. If we get to cryogenic, we could then start to get down here. So here's um, Kat's experiment. Here's, uh, nothing happening there. Sorry, that's meant to. Ah, there it is. You can see that. That's the experiment. You see, it's quite complicated. It's like a, what my PhD supervisor would say is a Christmas tree of servos. Um, needs to be in vacuum. Um, and there's all the, the noise cancellation uh, stuff. So if we do loop oscillators, we can cancel the noise a bit and you can get a better sensitivity. Um, and what we're looking for um, is, is identifying the ax axion signal. And we, search, we can search multiple spectra by the mode tunes. Uh, and we're looking in this Fourier frequency range. So here's the Fourier frequency here. So you can, you, in this Fourier frequency, you can look for a range of axion masses as you scan. And as you tune it, they can overlap, which is a benefit because if you have a, a signal, it should move in a certain way where the noise usually doesn't move as you tune. So the next experiment is a pumped experiment where external synthesizer is, um, is, can, is uh, locked to a cavity. And that's actually turns out to be more sensitive. It's a bit more complicated. You really have to, you, um, you get feed through from one um, mode and you have to, have to use that to cancel. When you amplify, you want to have a dark port, otherwise you generate flicker noise and you have to really cancel all your feed through in your resonator. This is something you don't see in the theory um, predictions. It becomes a complicated experiment. Um, but we have our two modes. 
um, and we generate it with a synthesizer, which we multiply by four, we lock to one mode, then with a the frequency shifter, we can see get the other mode. And um, basically we have two systems which are which have got noise cancellation. And when you look at this, it's starting to, to look a bit complicated, but it works. So here's the, um, the noise spectrum. This is the unlocked and this is the locked. And the, you get uh, quite a, a large um, uh, um, suppression of noise compared to the loop oscillator. So we're running with this at the moment. And this will allow us to get to some good sensitivities. This now when we haven't, We've started a data run yet, but it should bring us around here. That's coming soon. All the noise is good. Um, so if we want to look at ultralight axions, we've really got to tune these two close together here. Omega-1 has got to be approximately omega-2. And um, there's always going to be a, a difference. You, can't never, you can never practically make them the same frequency. Um, some other theorists think you can, but I think this is pretty much impossible. So you're always going to look at uh, there's going to be an offset with the plus or minus omega, but that means you can still look for ultralight axions you, with this detuning. And here's, a, here's an example of our two modes detuning, and probably the closest you can get in a system like this might be about a megahertz. You can see a megahertz here. And so if we get a megahertz, they're fairly distinct looking at one mode um, might work. And so if I had a one megahertz offset uh, in the Fourier spectrum, if I looked at a megahertz, this would be an axion of zero or two megahertz. If I looked here at 100 megahertz, this would be an axion of 900 or 1.1 megahertz. So you can do this, look for ultralight ultra, ultra axions. Measuring phase noise is another thing or any type of noise with a, such a small difference between two oscillators. If you use a standard phase noise measurement system, you will you, you won't measure the noise, you'll get, um, your measurement system will um, restrict you. Um, you need to build a special noise measurement system to be able to measure a noise with such a small offset. And this is another thing that, pe that um, people won't realize until they try and do it. <laughs> but we already realized this. So you have to, um, this is proof that Eugene measurements took when you had a two megahertz offset. Um, so yeah, at the noise we're getting out of these oscillators is state of the art. Um, so for the power measurement, you have to, you'll, you'll have feed through and you'll have to cancel your pump oscillator and your readout oscillator. You'll have to feed it through to cancel it before you amplify, otherwise it won't work. Um, and it's a dispersive system. So it's to calculate the noise is not non-trivial. AM and PM noise will be important. You'll get PM to AM conversions, and these are non-trivial calculations to work out the sensitivity. Um, but we are doing that at the moment. Uh, in the end, you want to go cryogenic, and if we did, we'd use the technology developed at Fermilab. It'd be a good way to, to do that. Um, so in the future, if we successful in this next version, we will look to push towards this, maybe just these would be another, tuning these is another um, kettle of fish, but maybe you can just do an ultralight axion experiment and not worry about tuning. We've, we've modeled them to see where you get the cross, you, you still get the um, possible mode pairs. So summary for this experiment is we've done the first tabletop experiment, uh, which is a two photon oscillator experiment uh, with two modes close in frequency. We set limits with a basic loop oscillator and we have now made improve, improvements with an external stabilized synthesizer, which should be able to get us um, around the cast limits or maybe better. And um, in the end with cryogenics, we should be sensitive enough for axion models and uh, we are constructing that at the moment. Okay, so with the time I have left, I uh, would just like to talk about halescopes in general for a bit and their sensitivity. Um, a nice way to look at any electrodynamic system and trying to know the energy and power flows is through the pointing vector where you can have source terms, storage terms through a capacitor or inductor or dissipative terms or radiation terms. So you have the volume and you have all those possibilities within that volume. 
So DC magnetic haloscopes, they can, their axions convert into post photons in the presence of a strong magnetic field. Mass is unknown. So narrowband photon signal of an unknown frequency is generated. So we have to scan the frequencies. I would say there's three regimes of haloscope detector. And if we look at that from low mass to high mass, we can put those three regimes. One is a lumped element reactive regime where the Compton wavelength of your axion is greater than the experiment. The other one is a resonant regime, which are the haloscopes, which I've been discussing uh, a bit um, and others, where your Compton wavelengths on the order of the experiment. Then there's your propagative, which is the Mad Max regime, uh, where your Compton wavelengths much less than the um, dimensions of the experiment. And as you go to higher mass, this becomes more important to do this type of experiment. Um, and you will, um, you will look uh, for these, depending on the mass you're interested, you'll build a different type of detector. For a resonant detector, you can draw fuzzy limits, maybe one centimeter to a meter, high, which would be 300 megahertz to 30 gigahertz. But of course that's fuzzy. You can make a resonator below this and you can actually go a little bit above this as well. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so that's about a mi micro EV to 100 micro EV. So these type of haloscopes, the, the lumped elements, there's a few different ones that are proposed um, and they, they're lumped elements under magnetic field. Um, there's the resonant ones, which are generally low order ones under low order resonances under magnetic field. And then there's like Mad Max and Bread, which you're propagating ones, which are, um, which are like this. And you notice that there is a difference here um, for the propagating mode, E and B are in phase. For the uh, resonant mode, your E and B are out of phase in your resonator, but the dissipative, the, the power that's dissipative um, looks at your E field, which is in phase with the B field. And so that's sort of got both. And this is just mainly reactive system. And you calculate the sensitivity in a different way. So if we remember pointing theorem, um, uh, it's the basic conservation law of electromagnetic theory. It describes complex power flow phases in a volume, considering sources, storage, dissipation, and radiation, like I said. The direction and density of power flow at a point is defined by the instantaneous pointing vector and one can define that um, like so, as we're familiar with undergraduate, and then you can write that in terms of complex phases if you want. And then if you expand that out, you get this um, two parts to it, one which is a DC term and one which is a twice frequency term. And that's sort of your down conversion and up conversion, I suppose. Um, but the average value of the instantaneous pointing vector is equal to this part here. Um, and that's a complex pointing vector. vector. Um, so if we're using phases, if we're gonna to go to phaser forms of electrodynamics and the pointing vector, we have what's called the complex pointing vector. And um, you have a real and imaginary term of the, the pointing vector. Um, and if you really wanted to, to write it out in a nice way, uh, so, you, so when you're doing calculations, it's unambiguous, the real part can be S1 plus S1 um, complex conjugate, and the imaginary part can be the negative of the two. You can't go wrong if you do that. Uh, so this is the time average power, and this is what's known as reactive power in your system. Um, so combining the pointing vector with Maxwell's equations leads to pointing theorem, and that's how you can calculate your sensitivities. Um, you have instantaneous pointing theorem, um, which I don't use, and you have complex pointing theorem. They're two different theorems. So if we want to consider the pointing vector axion electrodynamics, let me just briefly introduce you to the abraham Minkowski controversy. And pointing vector in electrodynamics is over a century of controversy to choose D cross B or E cross H in matter. And there was a long argument. In the end, um, just in 2007, the conclusion was that both are valid depending on the system. Uh, and there's this nice paper by Kingsler et al. that looks at four pointing theorems and enables interpretation of four pointing vectors in interaction with the medium and choosing the best pointing vector depending on the medium and experimental setup. 
And Griffiths even comes into this in the controversy and has done a paper which is quite um, educational. And the, the moral of the story is that um, when you look at momentum, the uh, Abraham momentum is related to kinetic momentum and the Minkowski to canonical momentum. That was the conclusion. If we look at the momentum of photons, there was two predictions in media and Minkowski was verified by Jones et al when media does not move. Um, if it's moving, then the Abraham pointing vector. The size of the central maximum in a single sit diffraction, there was also two predictions and Minkowski won there. So this is interesting. And if you look at this paper with four pointing theorem, um, it gives the four different versions of the, of the different fields and auxiliary fields. And you write down Maxwell's equations. Um, generally, you will see Maxwell's equations written as um, uh, electric currents in terms of electric current source terms. Um, but then when you introduce the auxiliary fields, um, it turns out that um, if you look at them in the most general way, you can get a modification to um, Faraday's law as well in non-conservative systems when the curl of P is non-zero, um, you get this modification and that's when you have uh, an external source driving your system. And let me say that the axion uh, and photon interacting is an external source driving another photon. So you have to look out to see if this term exists in the axion electrodynamics. And um, uh, in the end, you can have a magnetic current view of this, where if you have a magnet, uh, the divergence of the magnetization gives you poles at the two tops, and um, the rate of change of magnetization is a magnetic current, and the curl of P is also a magnetic current. So these doesn't mean that a uh, magnetic monopole exists, it's just, it's just a way of fictitiously describing matter like uh, bound currents. Bound electric charge is not a real, it's not real uh, free charge and current, it's just spin. And same, you can have a, a monopole model and that's what uh, people in the magnetic field use, they use these models. Uh, so bound electric current model, well, all I will say um, is that um, uh, if I take a magnet, uh, for example, uh, the curl of M defines an effective current around here, but that's not a real current, it's fictitious. And if in a dielectric, we have the rate of change of polarization gives you a polarization current, that's a dielectric term, and your bound charges are div dot P. These are all dielectric fictitious um, charges, um, fictitious currents. Uh, and in the modified Faraday's law, what does that mean? It means it's the same as an electret. Electret is, in a, is actually, this is in Griffiths, comes out of Griffiths. Uh, when you have electric, you have a bound charge. It's a voltage source and they're used in um, uh, uh, energy harvesting um, techniques. And you see here, this, this is your non-conservative term. To make an electret, you have a metastable term. You have, you have to separate charges and this is an effective magnetic current going around the boundary here. And you can model it if you want uh, in a similar way. Um, so you can either model bound monopole currents or fictitious bound ampere currents. And if the polarization is on zero, you have a voltage source. The way engineers look at this, if they have a voltage source, they call this an impressed field. I've actually, the, the right word for physicists is fictitious electric field. So that's what we should call it, a fictitious electric field. I realized that in the axion experiments that you know a, um, Andrew Garacci does, they, he uses a fictitious magnetic field. This is similar to a fictitious electric field. And if we look at electromagnetic force, the electrical action produced by a non-electrical source is a device that provides an EMF converting other forms into electrical energy. So it could be batteries, which would be or generators. And the word force in this case is not. Uh, an interaction between bodies. It's actually a fictitious force. A fictitious force is an EMF is a fictitious force. And the EMF per unit leg is like a fictitious, fictitious electric field, does not conform to Maxwell's equations. It's outside um, and it's uh, similar. And you can identify a similar term in axion uh, modified electrodynamics. I won't go into this, but this just shows you, you can generate a magnetic current by rotating a magnet. Uh, a magnet has poles on both ends and you can rotate a magnetic, these gets uh, magnetic currents rotating top and bottom, which generates a voltage. 
So the way engineers model voltage sources is through magnetic current and an electric current source via a current. And in phasor form, you can, you can have subscript I as your excitation currents, which are non-conservative inputs, and your dissipation loss is, is, is uh, due to conductivity. Uh, I just put this in for completeness, so I won't explain it, sorry, but it shows you um, how to calculate uh, from complex pointing theorem and circuits antennas, um, these different aspects. So if we go back to our experiments, what we have is a cavity. And the interesting thing in a cavity is that you have a, a reactive uh, field inside with B and E out of, phase, out of phase, but the loss gives you a dish of dissipation, which gives you a real part of the pointing vector. And that's because you have an imaginary part of the electric field due to the loss, which causes this dissipation. And so at resonance, the pointing vector is real. Um, the source doesn't supply reactive power, but the small dissipation, the power builds up due to this reactive buildup between the E and B field, and you get an enhancement due to large Q. So both are important. And that's the sort of thing you get. You can write a circuit analysis, but the, the point is in a high Q, you build up the system uh, into your frequency band, and that's how we want to detect the axion. So propagating pointing vector is real. Um, the, the, in the axion on resonance, you'll have real, but you get Q build up. In a capacitor, it's totally imaginary. Um, okay, I will finish up soon because I don't want to keep going on, but I'll, I'll come to the punchline. I won't go through all this. Um, I can just leave it for those who are interested with the, with the notes. But the point is, Pointing vector analysis of the phototonic conversion of the dark matter ax axion mix mixing with background DC magnetic field. When you apply pointing theorem to ax axion modified elect electrodynamics, you get the two possible pointing vectors analog analogous to Abraham and Minkowski. Minkowski picks up these non-conservative terms that the other one doesn't. And these non-conservative terms are actually characterized as curl forces, non-conservative non dissipated forces, they're fictitious electric fields outside the conservative Maxwell's equations. And they both give the same sensitivity for a resonant cavity haloscope, but predict different, predict different sensitivity for the low mass system. These curl forces exist. There's lots of papers on them uh, when, when you have a non-zero electric curl. And in axion electrodynamics, it happens too. You just, this is your fictitious electric field, which has a uh, and that you have this modified Faraday's law in the same way. And when you apply that, um, I won't go through this maths, this is just phase uh, uh, electrodynamics. You can either use this modification of Faraday, this Faraday's law, as we know, or this modification, like you do in a non-conservative system. And when you apply the two, you get a different value for um, capacitors. Um, for, the, for the haloscope, you get exactly the same. You, get it, you use pointing theorem, you, when you are um, on resonance, the reactive part of the pointing theorem is zero. The real part is non-zero. And from this real part, you get exactly what Tsukivi derived. And that's using the Abraham pointing vector. And for the Minkowski, you get the same thing for a, a normal haloscope. Um, you get the same calculation, even though the formulas are a bit different, it ends up to the same result. But for the, for the capacitor, when you use the different ones, the, the point is the reactive power is quite different in the two where the, the others rely on the real. So in a, in a capacitor, you have reactive power flow. And when you put in the values, the, the Abraham pointing vector gives you this suppression term, which is well known. You can't use, you can't use a capacitor to measure low mass axions, but if you, and when you calculate the voltage, this suppression with the Compton wavelength exists. But if you use the Minkowski one, you don't have any suppression. And the point is you have to use the reactive power for a capacitor, not the real. So, and this has been actually detailed in this paper, and there is an extra term that can give you a better sensitivity. And I'll end it there, because I know I've gone a bit over time. I just, I will leave the notes, um, the presentation for people to look if they're interested. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. A lot of a lot of uh, research. My God, uh, beautiful research, wonderful. Um, 
Uh, people have questions? Um, Can I make some questions? Yes, please. Uh, I'm sorry, Mikhail Lisitsky. There's some small questions about the uh, organ experiments. You talk, uh, you yeah. show the um, uh, uh, single photon detector based on the single general photon injunction. Uh, I should know, uh, I don't understand. Is it a real plan to, uh, to employ this uh, device in your experiment? Yes, we want to. Um, yes, we want to. We have some. We have some devices from Leonid, and we're testing them. Um, so uh, we've got them in the fridge at the moment. We've done a few runs, but we haven't been able to get. We've got a new um, high sensitivity current source to help us. Uh, let's see if I find where I had that. Um, yeah, but uh, we are very interested in single photon counters. Um, that is for our experiment to, to get to the model bands. We need that. We Michael, can't do it do without you, it. Do you yeah. need a, a well specified single photon to, uh, source to test this? Um, I think we can just attenuate. Um, I, th I think there wasn't there a talk earlier in the week where someone uh, just put photons, attenuated them from room temperature. And then as long as you have a cryogenic attenuated down, down the bottom, you should, that should work. It doesn't always work well. So uh, anyway, okay, you may, you may want to look into that. But the, my, I have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect your microwave cavities uh, where you pump one mode and you look in another mode for axions. Yeah. That's yeah. what you're doing. Those are superconducting yes. cavities, correct? Not at the moment. At the moment, they're not. They're just uh, copper. But the uh, ideal the one will will be, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Um, we could use sapphire, I guess, um, to get high Q, but that mm -hmm. would have other problems. But yes, yeah, superconducting. I know superconducting cavities will have a lot of problems with power, and. Um, okay. um, but they. But that's the design. If we. If, if we go to these uh, cavities, these superconducting cavities, um, they are designed for um, uh, for high, you know, for particle accelerators. So they are designed to try and take as high power and have right, high Q. Right, right. That's, that's yeah. the name of the game, anyway. Yeah. So yeah. They, they, these guys at Fermilab make the best. Though they're, they're the right. ones that you need to use. Um, so hopefully. They, they already said that they once we get there, they could design a cavity for us. But, you know, everyone's super busy trying no. to do their own stuff. So when we get there and we can show that it's worthwhile doing, then we will go down that path. I, I didn't get to my question yet. The, oh, the, yeah. the point is um, I, the axion coupling is really very, very low, very small. And, and uh, there is always crosstalk from the loss mechanism between the modes. Yes. Did you estimate how much that is? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that's to be, we want, um, we want the modes to be on orthogonal. Uh, so we want infinite loss between them. Um, uh, but in course they're not. If we go back to this uh, picture, they hybridized to some extent. Um, Right. So this is going to be a limitation. Yeah. Okay. That's a definitely okay. a limitation. Uh, uh, and that's maybe not appreciated so much by um, people who write down theory, but um, you won't be able to tune them together exactly. And especially when you pump one with a higher power, because then you get injection locking um, and all sorts of things. So they're going to have to have an offset. I think a megahertz offset is, is doable. Any uh, any other question? Well, if not, let's thank Professor Michael Tover again for the beautiful set of action experiments he described to us. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Janice. Thank you. Thank you.